I was reading uh, by a fellow by the name of John Blanchard, and he brought out some statistics and things. I want to try to share some of those facts today with some other things. And uh, it really spoke to my heart, especially about witnessing. The title of my message this morning is Witnessing to Our Culture When They Don't Want God. Witnessing to Our Culture When They Don't Want God. And uh, today, at times, it's really difficult uh, to witness to people uh, that are anti-God, anti-Christian, anti-absolute truth of the word, anti-morality, anti-responsibility, on and on it goes. And uh, growing in America, as we can see it, as a whole, they think that God does not exist or they want to blame him for all the suffering and all the evil that's taking place in our country. And so when we're trying to witness, that's the mindset of many people today. And it's growing and it's growing. They say this, evil and suffering are in the world. If God were all powerful, he could prevent evil and suffering. If God exists, if all-powerful, all-loving, there will be no evil, no suffering in the world. But since there is suffering and evil, God is therefore powerless, loveless, or non-existent, and the Bible then is not true. That's their conclusion. And uh, uh, they promote that quite a bit. Usually this thinking comes from a moment of somebody going through some terrible trauma. Uh, I remember reading about Ted Turner and when his sister had died. That's when he turned his back and said, there is no God. Back in Kosovo, uh, they were doing in the 1990s ethnic cleansing. And in one area, they took 10 women, they raped them, and then they made their families watch at that moment. The mother said later on, it was then that I came to know that God does not exist. This is the atheist creed. They make this their creed. There is no God because evil and suffering prove it. But there are three things that show there are other reasons why people suffer and suffer pain, suffer evil, and other things. The first one's natural disasters. In 1953, there was a hurricane that hit South America. 12,000 drowned and were crushed, and it left millions homeless. Winds went up to 150 miles an hour. In 1999, Venezuela, uh, they had torrential rains, and 30,000 people perished from those rains and floods. In December 4, 2004, an earthquake hit in waters close to Indonesia. They said it was like the force of a thousand atomic bombs. It actually caused 36 more earthquakes. One of them were 9.0 on the Richter scale. It created a tsunami wave going 500 miles an hour. It killed over 220,000 Indonesians. Then the surrounding islands, some 10,000 people perished. Eighty minutes later, that wave hit Thailand. Over 5,000 died there. Then it hit Sri Lanka, killing thousands. As a matter of fact, 45,000. 15,000 of those people who perished were just children. Two hours later, it hit India's coast. And... Uh, it claimed 10,000 lives at that moment. And it was on a Sunday, so there were some churches that were gathering, and it just washed the churches and the congregations away. They don't exist anymore. This past summer in America, we saw the hurricanes hitting, and we saw the life that it took and the damage in Texas and the Gulf Coast and Florida, Costa Rica, billions of dollars worth of damage. We've been seeing the California wildfires, uh, loss of life and the damage, and then also the mudslides that's been taking place. So there are natural disasters. Not only that, there are accidents that take place. 
that causes suffering. John Polkenhome is his name. He said this, we live in a world with ragged edges where order and disorder interlace with each other. There are billions of accidents. Most are trivial, but the outcome of some is appalling. That one word is enough, just enough to identify them years later. Example, Titanic. Titanic, when it went down, took 1,500 people down with it. DuPont in India, back in the 80s, it leaked toxic gas out. 4,000 people died immediately, 16,000 more died a little bit later on, and they have 150,000 who are still being treated because of that toxic gas. Chernobyl, you remember the reactor that exploded. 800,000 Ukrainians and children came down with leukemia. They say it will take 200 years before that whole place is uh, 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 cleaned up from the... Uh, contamination from the radiation and everything. And so you have these accidents. Every day we have cars, trains, airplanes, ships, machinery, malfunctions, and on and on it goes. So you have natural disasters. You have accidents that cause suffering and pain. But not only that, the evil comes in on man on man. History shows man's inhumanity to man. In the last 4,000 years, there's only been 300 years where there's not been a war. Somebody said that gives the people a chance to reload for the next one. (laughs) That's probably true. In World War I, uh, uh, the world lost 30 million people. In World War II, there were so many, so vast, they can't count them all. Just along with the Jews, Hitler and the Holocaust, there was 6 million Jews that were killed right there. In China, Mao Tse Tung, however you say his name, executed 22,000 of his own people every month. Every month, 22,000. And by the way, today, 3,030 Christians will be martyred for their faith around the world. That's today. We're awful fortunate just to be living where we are today, are we not? We think of Cambodia's Pol Pot. He slaughtered a million and 500,000 of his own citizens. He created what was known as the killing fields. They had a movie about that. We've had our Vietnam. Rwanda, 1994, there were 800,000 African victims, most of them killed by machetes. Unbelievable, leaving 350,000 orphan children. In America, we think of our disaster, 9-11, and it was awful. We had 3,000 plus, plus Washington, D.C. and western Pennsylvania there. But as you look back in history, in the Civil War, uh, the North trying to help free, give freedom to, sla- uh, to slaves, and they were against slavery, we lost 250,000 people just on the north side. That's not counting how many was on the south side. In Russia, Lenin and Stalin, they killed millions. In 2004, Chechen uh, separatists, uh, they raided a school, a middle school. They held captive 1,000 children and held them hostage. The Russian troops stormed that school. And those terrorists killed 350 children right there. And hundreds more went to the hospital. It was just a barbaric act on these people. And then we have the Middle East. You have Syria. It's hard telling how many people. They stopped counting after 100,000. I mean, it's just been horrific. And uh, you have uh, the terrorist Muslims on the rise. You have ISIS and the atrocities that they've committed. And everywhere we look, we see evil and suffering. And you have the lesser ones. Uh, When you watch the nightly news, it's almost like a police report, isn't it? And you get tired of that. We turn, try to watch something else the first 15 minutes and turn back so that they might get over some of those things. And the question comes, where is God? Well, Jewish author... Eli Weissel, 
He survived the Holocaust, and he wrote a book called Night. He gave some of its horrors. He said babies were pitchfork as if they were bales of straw, children watching other children being hanged. His mother and other members of his family were thrown into the furnace fueled by human bodies. Where the prisoners groan, where is God? Where is he? Where can he be now? When it was all over, Weissel said this about the whole event. He says, all of these events murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams into dust. He never believed in God again. And by the way, the majority of Israel are atheists or agnostics even today in their country. After watching world gone, gone mad with greed and aggression, Brian Sewell said this, I cease to believe in God and abandon faith and its observance. So to many people, the case against God seems watertight. But is it? Here's our question. Why should issues of good and evil or human suffering cause any problems? I mean, you know, if it's like Bertrand Russell... And other people, if, if they were right to dismiss man as a curious accident in a backwater, that's what he said, <laughs> if that's the way they believe, why should it matter if, in the least if lives end slowly or suddenly, peacefully or painfully, one by one or by masses? What does it matter if that's all we are? Oxford professor Peter Atkins, he's a dogmatic atheist. He said, man is just a bit of slime on a planet. Now, if that's the case, then why, why do we weep when people are removed? Man is just the result of countless chemical and biological accidents. They have no value. Whether it's a dictatorial regime or natural disasters that kills millions of people, if we're no more than biological flukes with no meaningful origins or destiny, what then does it matter about suffering and pain and evil? And by the way, what do they offer you? Huh? What kind of hope do they give you? When they die, they're all dressed up with no place to go. Amen? Even evolutionary thought gives no morality. If we've evolved, how can we jump from atoms to ethics, from molecules to morality? If we are merely genetically programmed machines, how can we condemn evil or say what's good if that's all that we are? Here's some awkward facts for mankind. Our planet can feed six to eight billion people easily. But why are millions suffering and dying of starvation each year. Is that God's fault? In India, millions are dying of hunger and the religion forbids them to eat cows. And cows are all around them. Can their food problems be blamed upon a God that they ignore? Think of the suffering caused by human error and incompetence. We mentioned the Titanic the reason so many people were lost is they didn't put enough lifeboats on a ship. Couldn't handle them all. Chernobyl, that reactor exploded because of defective safety rules. Is God to blame for that? Suffering, that's self-inflicting. Smokers, they have a higher risk of lung cancer and heart disease. Heavy drinkers, drug addicts, wrong sex who... Some come down with AIDS or STDs or so on. Gluttons dig their own graves. Workaholics have mental stress and breakdowns. Illnesses that come from hatred, anger, bitterness, and envy. Is God to blame for their behavior and the consequences of their behavior? A pilot's error who, who uh, uh, causes a plane to go down? A drunken motorist causes an accident. A train or a ship captain ignores safety procedures. 
A football player is hit in the head and has some brain problems as a result of playing football? Is, the, is God guilty at blame for all that? You see, the link between wrongdoing and its consequences is clear. Ravi Zacharias, the great mind thinker and Christian man, he was in a discussion, him and a couple of his friends, with a business tycoon. Uh, the man was very, very wealthy. And the businessman asked Ravi, he said, why was God silent when there was so much evil in the world? And one of Ravi's friends asked the business tycoon, he said, since evil seems to trouble you so much, I would be curious to know what you have done about the evil you've seen within yourself. Ravi said there was a red-faced silence. Are those criticizers of God, are they doing everything possible to remove the evil from their own life so that they won't be guilty of causing evil and suffering to other people? And if not, are they the ones qualified to criticize God of mismanagement of the universe? Listen, if we could understand all that there is to know about God, he would no longer be God. Amen? There's no reason to assume God owes us an explanation for anything that happens in this world. To say that God doesn't tell us everything is not to say that he tells us nothing. Amen? Isaiah 55, 8 says this here, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. You see, there's a great gap difference in how God thinks versus how man thinks. And not to know that, to think that man knows as much as God, that is total madness. While the Bible doesn't tell us everything we would like to know sometimes, it does tell us all we need to know. And the question shouldn't be about God today. The question should be, what's wrong with the world? And if man were, if man were honest, man would say, I am. Man is the problem within this world. You see, when God created everything, he created it good. It was good he made him personal, able to live in a relationship with God and man. It was good that he made him a moral being with a conscience, being able to discern between right and wrong. Romans 2.15 says, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. You know, they actually can't say that they're a true atheist, they don't believe in God, because it's in them. Do you know that? They're just saying something that's not true. It was good that he made them able to be rational, to think, to draw moral conclusions, to make sensible decisions, to have a free will to obey God because you love God, but also to disobey God. God did not make us robots. Amen? What kind of life would that be? Huh? But we know what happened to man. It was man's fault, man's sin, Adam's sin. Romans 5, 12 says this, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And Adam, at that time, he lost his spiritual relationship of obedience with God. That was shattered his spiritual life that related with God was gone. It became dead. Man lost his innocence. His very nature was infected with sin. Man became godless. His sin brought about and brings about sinful actions, decay, disease, death, rebellion. And this sinfulness was and is passed on to Adam's children. Onto your parents, onto you and to me. 
Galatians 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such alike, of which I tell you before, as I also have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All those things is within mankind, and mankind is capable of doing them. We shouldn't be surprised what we see going on in the world. People today don't even know if they're a man or a woman or an it. They just don't know. You know, that's what happens when a world excludes God. Amen? They go, they go down the rabbit hole, I'm telling you. Jeremiah 17, 9 is so true. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's who man is. And that's why there is suffering. That's why there is evil that's taking place in this world. There are consequences for sinful actions. To blame God, man thinks that he can remove himself from God's authority. From his own responsibility. But God says in Romans 1, 19 and following, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, man, even his eternal power and Godhead. Now get this, so that they are without excuse. He might try to get away the authority and his own responsibility, but one day they'll stand before God and will be without excuse because they know better. It's in them. And by the way, I thought I'd mention Romans 9.20 right here. Nay, but O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? God said, you don't even have a right to question me. I'm the potter, you're the clay. Shut up. Amen. Amen? Amen? The Bible teaches that although God allows evil and suffering to coexist for a time, even though we might not understand it at times, they will one day be eliminated. There's coming a day when the wicked will not prevail nor prosper, and the saved will no longer suffer evil. Paul said it like this in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight and glory. What we go through in this world is nothing compared to what God has for us in the future. Romans 8, 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's our hope. And also, let me just remind you, natural disasters and uh, accidents and man on man. But since man tries to do away with God, they have no view of Satan. And Satan is a very active individual behind the scenes in these places around this world that causes people to do such horrific things. It states in Ephesians 6, 11, and 12, put, a, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the tricks, the traps of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And regardless of what man says, there is a real devil. And he has his own dark army. And he's behind the scenes filling the minds and causing people to go crazy, to do dark and horrific acts against mankind itself. Blanchard said this, the existence of evil and suffering does not eliminate God, but the existence of God guarantees the elimination of suffering and evil one day. Amen? And I, I opened my Bible and went to Revelation immediately, Revelation and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, 
neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. One day evil and suffering will be removed from this world. But if those people don't ever get saved, they'll be in a place called hell. And they'll not be able to experience a world without suffering and without pain. What we have to do, we have to remember our message. Our message is the fact that God entered the realm of human suffering and evil himself. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word, what? was God, Christ, and the Word was made flesh. Who was made flesh? Jesus Christ. And dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. God came into this world. He lived in this world until His full plan was accomplished to destroy sin, evil, suffering, and even death itself. Hebrews 4.15 says this, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Even though he was in a world of sin, he never sinned himself. Romans 4.25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. He came in this world to die on a cross for your sin and for my sin, and he rose from the grave victorious. And because of that, we have hope. Romans 8.30 says this, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, he, uh, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. God has a purpose in his plan when he saves one. From the start to the finish, he guarantees it. Amen. Amen. And the way that we get that for our life is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel right there. And if you will believe in that with your heart, that what Christ did for you on the cross and the empty tomb, if you believe that, God says he saves you right then. Amen. Amen? Thank God for his grace gospel. So we see suffering, evil, natural disasters, accidents, sins, consequences, atrocities, Satan's working, all of this. And sometimes these things, when they happen in our life, are God's wake-up calls for us. They're warning us that suffering and evil, it's real. Life is brief, it's fragile, and unless the rapture happens, death is certain. C.S. Lewis said this, people need reminded they're not the center of the universe. And it's interesting how suffering and evil and things that come into our life help us to look to God and remind us we are not the center of the universe. And for sure, we know this, Hollywood and the news media and Washington, D.C. are not the center of this universe. God is the center of this universe. Amen? Sometimes God uses suffering and evil to develop our character, our faith, our trust, our love of him. In the Old Testament, it was Job. In the New Testament, it's the Apostle Paul. Sometimes suffering and evil reveals the temporal versus the eternal. We know that the, when we see what's going on, we know that the things of this world will pass away. And God says, I'm trying to remind you that your priorities are not to be on the things of this world that pass away, but your priority ought to be on me and my way for your life. And suffering evil reminds us of our Savior, what he was willing to go through to deliver us. Here's something I was read and I thought it was good. At the end of time, Billions of people were scattered on a great plain before God's throne. Most shrank from the brilliant light before them. But some groups near the front talked heatedly, not with cringing shame, but with belligerence. Can God judge us? How can we know about suffering? 
snapped a pert young brunette. She ripped open a sleeve to reveal a tattooed number from a Nazi concentration camp. We endured terror, beating, torture, death. In another group, a black man lowered his collar. What about this, he demanded, showing the ugly rope burn. Lynch for no crime but being black. In another crowd, a pregnant school girl with sullen eyes. Why should I suffer, she murmured. It wasn't my fault. Far out across the plain were hundreds of such groups. Each complained against God for the evil and suffering he had permitted in the world. How lucky God was to live in heaven where all the sweetness and light were, where there was no weeping or fear or hunger or hatred. What did God know of all, of all that men had been forced to endure in this world? For God leads a pretty sheltered life, they said. So each group sent forth their leader, chosen because he had suffered the most. A Jew, a black, a person of Hiroshima, a horribly disabled, arthritic person, a trafficker, child. In the center of the plain, they consulted with each other. At last, they were ready to present their case. It was rather clever. Before God could be qualified to be their judge, he must endure what they had endured. Their verdict was that God should be sentenced to live on earth as a man. Let him be born a Jew. Let the legitimacy of his birth be doubted. Give him the work so difficult that even his family will think he's out of his mind when he tries to do it. Let him be betrayed by his closest friends. Let him face charges, be tried by a prejudiced jury and convicted by a cowardly judge. Let him be tortured. At last, let him see what it means to be terribly alone. Then let him die in agony. Let him die so that there can be no doubt that he died. Let there be a whole host of witnesses to verify that. As each leader announced the portion of his sentence, a loud murmur of approval went up from the throng of people assembled. When the last had finished pronouncing sentence, there was a long silence. No one uttered another word. No one moved. For suddenly, all knew that God had already served his sentence. Amen? There's a lot of people out there. They're sharp. They're anti-God. They're difficult to witness to. But our message is their only hope. And in reality, inside, God has placed some things there. They're hurting, and they need help. The other night I was watching TVN. Forgive me. And, uh, no, I take that back. It was Daystar. Daystar. Just as bad. Okay. <laughs> and they had this girl on, and she used to be an atheist. And she said, you know, I, I had all the answers to all the Christians' arguments. I could debate them. And as she talked, you could see she was intelligent. She was brilliant. She said, but she had this neighbor who had been very, very kind to her. And this neighbor continually invited her to church. She says, so I said to myself, the only way I'm going to get this woman off my back is I'm going to go to church. And so she went to a little United Methodist church. There were about 40 people there, she said. And it was a Sunday evening service. But she said the people, when they sang, they praised God. And she said, I knew within me they had something I did not have. She said it was at that moment that God moved on her heart. And she says at the back of that church while they were praising God, she said, God saved me in a miraculous way back there. And I gave my heart to Christ. I believed in him. And as a result of that, she debates atheists now. See, sometimes in our witness, we don't have all the answers. Huh? But we do have 
a testimony. We do have a word in the sense that, listen, I can't answer all those questions, but I do know this, that I was lost. And one day, God showed himself to me in his word of how much he loved me and died for me and rose again. And by faith, I gave him my heart. I believed in him. And he's changed my life. Now I have hope. I have comfort. And I just hope one day you'll have that same hope too. Move on. Amen. You know, it's hard to keep hitting somebody when they continue to say they love you. And that's what you're doing. You know, I might not know all the answers, but I know what Christ did for me. And I can share that and then go on and let God do his work in one's heart. Amen? Let's bow our heads. How many of you would say to me this morning that if you were to die this, this day, this moment, you know where you would spend eternity. You know without a doubt because you put your faith in Christ and the gospel. You've believed in it. And you know you'd go to heaven. Let me see your hands. Amen. That's the majority of all of us here. Amen. Perhaps you're here this morning and you couldn't say that. And maybe through this stumbling preacher here, God used something to speak to your heart. And you would say to me, Pastor, I'm not saved, but I sure would like to be. Anybody like that, just raise your hand. I don't come out there or anything like that and get you. I just, anybody. Father, you've seen the hands, you know the hearts. And I just pray that there wouldn't be one person that would walk out of here not knowing you and what you've done for them. You died for him, you were buried, and you rose again. You took the penalty, the punishment of their sin upon your own body on that cross, but you rose even defeating death itself, the conqueror of death. And for that message, we want to thank you. And if there's somebody here this morning that does not know they're going to heaven, I pray that after the service, I pray they come up, let us talk to them. We, we love the opportunity because of what you did for us. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? We hope that you received a blessing from today's broadcast. We would love to have you to visit us in person Sunday at 10 a.m. in New Whiteland. You can watch us live and view past services on our website at gpindy.net. For more information, please visit our website or contact us by phone. Until next week. May God richly bless you is our prayer.